Jordan, I've got to say, full disclosure, when, when you put out that research, it dropped into my email inbox and I was on Bloomberg Radio and I turned to a guest and I asked them about it and they laughed at me. It was the first piece of research <laughs> that I've seen in my inbox about what does it mean for a Jeremy Corbyn win and seriously, they laughed at me. And I, I go back to that because no one was really pricing in that scenario and you just said that to some extent we're pricing in the tail risk. Are we really pricing in the tail risk at 128.37, the pound against the dollar? We're pricing in a very low probability of that tail risk, I might add. So if you look at the betting markets to kind of get an idea of what pe the punters are saying, the weighted average of probabilities tells you the market thinks Theresa May still gets around 80 seat majority. If I look at all the models, apart from the one that came out from YouGov overnight, they're still pointing to 90 to 100 seat majority for Theresa May. So we're pricing a very small, maybe 10% probability of that Labour scenario, I would say. But Megan, the whole point of having the snap election was to give uh, Theresa May some kind of mandate uh, going into Brexit negotiations. Is that totally now off the table? Well, I'm not sure it's off the table. You're right. The whole point was for her to <clears throat> excuse me, increase her majority so that she would go in with a stronger hand. Um, if she does lose seats, actually, she might have a slightly weaker hand. But let's face it, she has an incredibly weak hand. Anyhow, I mean, we're all obsessed with what the UK wants, but what we should be looking is, at is what the EU wants, and that won't change whether it's Corbyn or Theresa May representing the UK. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, you know, maybe the UK isn't looking for strong leadership. Maybe they're looking for a character. So if this is actually about character, then um, you can see why Jeremy Corbyn's come ahead. And Emma mentioned that um, some of the reason that we've seen a, a move in the polls is because of what um, the Tories have put forward, but actually, Labor's put forward a manifesto that is economically bonkers, but um, it does fundamentally offer something different, and maybe that's what people are looking for. So what is the election actually about? It's a great question, um, and I think it depends um, who you're asking. For a lot of people, I think it is a vote on Brexit and whether they're interested in it and whether they want to be in the single market. But for a lot of people, I think all politics are pretty local. So for a lot of people, it's about their benefits and the dementia tax. And John, what does your mom think the election is about? Uh, this is how I get thing. the real read here. <laughs> my, my mom is suffering from political fatigue. Okay, and, so and she's I not going to vote. And, and I just wonder, Jordan, how significant that actually is, because when they conduct these polls, there are people that are say they will definitely vote when the vote comes around. How important will that actually be? And, and the youth, so to speak, those in the, the lower age bracket that says they're going to vote, they also say they're going to vote Labour. Are they going to show up next week? I think the youth vote is the interesting thing. It's always uh, overestimated how many of them show up. They tend to disappoint anyone who has those big hopes. But if you take the polling support by age, anybody <laughs> under the age of 50 is more likely to vote Labour than they are the other way around. So, so the Conservatives control the upper end of the age brackets. But in terms of what this election is being fought on, if you look at the Yuga <laughs> polls, there's some very interesting stuff on terms of the manifestos. Theresa May hits it home, a home run when it comes to Brexit. But like Megan talked about, it's not really about Brexit this election. It's about domestic policies. And the Labour manifesto, whilst it may be economically bon bonkers, using Megan's word uh, for it, it's actually all of the anti-austerity and higher spending on education really ranks very highly. So the free education for higher education, that's the university fees, that big promise from Labour is actually one of the vote winners that's winning around the youth vote. So, Megan, one of the things we've learned about polls is forget the numbers, the absolute numbers, direction really counts. If you look at the last election here, whatever you think about Donald Trump, he was moving up in the polls while Hillary Clinton was moving down. The direction here seems to be one direction only, and that's toward labor. So, however it comes out, it looks like they're really on the rise. What would it mean if they were, even with a coalition, to be able to try to implement their policies for labor? Well, I think it would mean uh, increased spending, certainly, so there would be renewed concerns about the UK's fiscal house. Um, but also, it would mean probably a softer Brexit, which um, some people might be in favor of, and that's why some are arguing that the pound might actually rally off the back of this. Well, Jordan, explain that. Why would it mean a softer Brexit in this sense? If you're on the other side of this ne negotiation, why don't you toughen your stance at that point? Because you feel that really, if Jeremy Corbyn, heaven forfend, were the uh, prime minister, it would really be a weak opponent. Well, you have to remember the, sh the makeup of Europe that tend, tend to be more of a centre-left leaning type of government in place in France and even Germany to some extent you can talk about that in terms of Merkel versus Schultz. But it would be quite welcome if the EU had someone who was willing to negotiate who wasn't talking about walking away if they get a bad deal. 
it's that no deal's better than a bad deal really does frustrate the Europeans because they know it's a bluff. It's very unlikely we have that cliff edge, so to speak. And if you have someone who acknowledges the benefits of the single market are worth fighting for, which is what Labour's manifesto is pointing out, it is possibly a better deal uh, making opportunity for the EU. Now, when it comes to Labour manifesto, what's very interesting is the word of benefits. And I'm not talking about fiscal benefits on uh, handouts. I'm talking about they want the benefits of the single market. But at the same time, they do talk about controls on labour and migration. But the main point I would make here is Labour's not going to get majority if they do get a chance of being in number 10. It will be a coalition with the SNP and the Lib Dems. And they may be able to rein back Labour's assertion on immigration. And therefore, the, U the EU can actually work with the UK on that sort of softer Brexit angle. Hey, and Jordan, following off from your research, it could mean higher gilt yields, it could mean a stronger pound, because it could mean less reliance on the Bank of England to stimulate the economy. But if we wake up on June 9th with a hung parliament, and the idea that maybe Prime Minister May has to step down. Talk to me about the initial reaction in Stirling that day. It's going to be lower, John, because you don't know with certainty who's going to form the next coalition. The Conservatives could even try the 1974 February election where you had a minority government stay in place until the next election held in October. So they could try and hold a minority government, a sort of confidence and supply agreement with one of the smaller parties to get through those months uh, afterwards. So that the markets won't like that uncertainty. In fact, the whole point of starting rallying when we had the election announced was that stronger hand for Brexit for Theresa May. But then if the S&P, Labour and Lib Dems within a few days come to an agreement, because it's not going to be within the first 10 minutes like markets will want, after discussions in, the, in those back rooms about what they're going to give up and what they're going to sacrifice to have a coalition, then the market might get that good news. So I do think sterling will head lower on a hung parliament announcement, but then there will be opportunities to fade it and buy the dip.